Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for coming. I know it's the last session of the day, so hopefully you're not all trying to run out the door and get beers or whatever at the end of the day. Um, but thank you all very much again for coming to Serverless Security Made Simple. Uh, my name is Mike McDonald. I'm a product manager on Google Cloud Platform, working on Cloud Functions, App Engine, and the newly announced Cloud Run product. Um, so. Uh, just to kind of baseline, how many people would say uh, they know what the word security means, but beyond that, nothing? So like kind of intro, beginner security. OK, couple, couple folks. Um, maybe like intermediate. Maybe like you wrote a crypto algorithm in college once. Uh, OK, and then um, let's say like advanced security people. Uh, so like you professionally write crypto algorithms, which you shouldn't do. Don't do that. Don't ever roll your own crypto. Um, OK, so good, good baseline there. Um, we're actually going to start off just kind of talking very broad brushstrokes. So there's kind of no assumption of you know anything about you know, crazy security things now. We're going to try and get on a baseline of, you know, hey, what are threats? What are some common threats that you might deal with? Um, and then actually say, OK, what about in serverless? Right? Serverless allows you to forget about a bunch of those threats, uh, but also kind of introduces some new ones that we need to deal with. And then lastly, running serverless on Google Cloud Again, because you're running on a managed environment, we can eliminate some of those threats, and we give you some tools to deal with other ones. And then lastly, uh, we have our friends from Protego uh, who is, are going to do a demo on you know, how they can also bring their product on top of, of our uh, serverless solutions to further increase your security. Cool. So we're going to start off on a baseline of what is a threat environment? Right? And so we start off with a very high level view of that. And it's kind of the category of who are the people uh, or systems that may attack you. Right? And those could be everything from uh, you know, hackers for profit on the internet, foreign governments, um, though most likely it's you know, people inside your organization who screw things up. Right? They accidentally press, press RMRF you know, dot star and delete everything. Right? That is still a threat that you have to deal with. And then similarly, you know, in addition to knowing who your threats are, uh, or you know, who, who the attackers might be, understanding kind of what targets are available, right? If you have a database publicly accessible on the internet, that's an obvious target. But there may be some other less obvious targets, right? There have been a lot of interesting you know, hacking attacks where someone had a password written on a Post-it note that was in the back of a photo, right? Like, that's potentially a target that you have to deal with. And then lastly, what tools might be used, right? If you understand who is attacking you, the targets that they're attacking, and the tools that, you're, that they're using, you have a much better way of understanding how you can defend against those threats, right? Because that's what you're trying to do. You're not trying to outrun everyone. You're trying to outrun the other slow people, right? You, your security has to be better than everyone else. And that's hopefully why you're coming to serverless, because you get a bunch of that for free, and then you configure the little bits on top. So um, this is also one of my favorite comics. If, if hopefully, everyone here reads a lot of XKCD. Right? But there's kind of this hacker world of, you know, oh, god, the laptop is encrypted. We need to you know, write a new algorithm to do it. But the reality is you know, it's a $5 wrench that, that gets the, the password on the laptop. Right? And so that's kind of this idea of threat models. You want to optimize for the what's going to happen commonly and defend against that rather than those kind of you know, scenarios that maybe you dream of but are low, low probability. Um, so this talk is actually kind of modeled off of a couple of kind of top 10 threats that we see in serverless. Uh, so the OWASP serverless top 10 and the cloud security uh, group serverless security top 12. And those are kind of the, obviously, top threats that they see. There's a lot of overlap between these. And we're going to go through a number of them. So things like uh, what malicious code is and where you might get it and you know, potential for remote code execution. Uh, denials of service, storing your credentials insecurely, um, and then everything down to even this idea of poor developer experience. Right? If your developers have a manual tool chain, they're copying things around, there's a much higher chance that something's going to go wrong, which is a threat to your environment. So we're going to start off with this idea of a zero day. So how many people have heard of zero days? Everyone in the room. Exactly. So why does it matter? Right? Why is a zero day so bad? Typically, you have this thing called the window of vulnerability. So a vulnerability is disclosed. So like Spectre or Meltdown, you know, right? We get an email that's like, oh my god, this terrible thing happened. There's a patch out. You know, you can go and fix using this patch. And that's where this kind of danger zone begins, right? Everyone knows that this is a vulnerability, and it can be exploited. But ideally, you know, you can patch things quickly enough that that danger zone is relatively small. That window of, of vulnerability is relatively small. The problem with zero days and really you know, kind of any unknown vulnerability is that that danger zone is now much, much larger. 
right? There is an exploit active somewhere in the wild. Maybe it's a remote code execution in your function or you know, some insecure credential that you don't know about. And until you discover it, you know, kind of this t equals zero all the way up to the present where it's active, that's a very, very dangerous place. And why this is important is those things could occur anywhere in your stack, right? So if you're building on top of, you know, some VM, like, you know, I have a, a server, like a Raspberry Pi at home running things on the internet, I'm responsible for, you know, hardware and network on that. I have to patch the operating system, you know, when something like Spectre happens. I, I'm responsible for that. I'm running a node server on top of that. I'm responsible for updating node whenever it, it gets their security patches. And then I'm also responsible for the dependencies that I'm pulling in in my app in addition to my app code, right? And that's a lot for me to think about when my Raspberry Pi server is, you know, controlling my light bulb, right? But if, you know, and, and it's relatively low, you know, risk if my light bulb gets hacked, but it's a lot of stuff that I have to worry about, and I would, I would like it, obviously, if my light didn't turn on at random times. And so the whole goal of serverless is to reduce what you're thinking about, right? Shove all of those, you know, potential vulnerabilities, you know, the, the zero days, they're gonna wipe out your application because you're not worried about updating the operating system. You're not worried about updating the hardware. You're not even worried about updating the language runtime in many cases. You're just focusing on what matters to you in your business, which is the application code that you write and the dependencies that you're pulling in. So we do a couple things for you in this world, right? If you're using Cloud Functions, App Engine, or Cloud Run, we are automatically doing a bunch of those upgrades. So in the Cloud Functions case, things like your function framework, so the code that actually wraps that, that little function that you write, the language runtime and operating system. Same on App Engine, language runtime and operating system. And then on Cloud Run, so Cloud Run is our newest serverless containers product, where you can actually provide an arbitrary container image which could have you know, some crazy operating system, you could be pulling in native dependencies, we don't know. So we can't do kind of the same you know, operating system level things you know, potentially yet. Um, there is a world where we're looking at, hey, we'll give you a you know, Google Ubuntu base image that we are automatically upgrading, or a Google Python base image that we're automatically updating. Um, so stay tuned for more of that, of how we kind of make that world a little better. And then there's another question, uh, and it was actually asked downstairs uh, in our serverless panel earlier today of, right, we are running a bunch of containers under the hood for all of those products, and we're running them in a multi-tenant environment. That's how we can scale to, you know, 10,000 containers in five seconds. Um, and we're doing that because we run on this massive multi-tenant infrastructure. And there's a really cool product called Gvisor. So Gvisor is an open source kernel. You can go to gvisor.dev. Um, and it basically intercepts all of the syscalls from the, the kind of developer untrusted container and then would remap them or disallow them so that you can't have, you know, people going and, uh, you know, messing with other containers. Um, we also have a thing called gcontain uh, or gcontainer that does kind of the same idea but for, you know, memory and CPU. So you can't have, you know, kind of noisy neighbors taking up other, other you know, resources on that multi-tenant uh, environment. Okay, so that's kind of, you know, base what Google does for you. Um, let's talk about another one. So malicious code and remote code execution. So it turns out there are lots and lots of ways to get bad code, right? The internet is a very scary place. Um, number one, just like don't trust anything that pulls code from Pastebin, right? Like there have been a number of vulnerabilities. There was a great one last year um, in ESLint where, you know, someone checked in code that just pulled from an arbitrary Pastebin URL and then evaled that code and wrote it to another Pastebin URL. Like, those are kind of obvious ones, um, but there are, you know, some other, uh, you know, having other low quality dependencies that may not be as obvious, such as, uh, you know, maybe there are performance bugs like they do uh, crazy regular expression parsing uh, that end up causing, causing performance issues. Um, or another really common one is you have multiple environments, and so you have, you know, a development environment where your developers can do whatever they want, and then you have a production environment that's more locked down. And maybe if you're sharing those environments, dependencies will make their way over from development through testing and into production, and maybe they don't have the performance or the security, uh, you know, requirements that, that you have. So how do you know about any of those vulnerabilities, by the way, right? If you're using an open source package, how would you have any idea if it was vulnerable? Um, so there are a bunch of three-letter acronyms that I'm going to throw out, and by the way, feel free, yes, take photos so that you don't have to remember them all. Um, so CVEs, I'm sure a lot of people have heard of these. Um, so it is kind of a, uh, a way of tracking these common vulnerabilities and exposures. And they do so by assigning every CVE a number. 
And so CNAs provide numbering for those. So you'd see, you know, CVE12345 is X. Um, and so open source projects, so Node is a great example of this. They have a, uh, the Node CVE numbering authority. So every single Node issue gets a number, goes into their tracking system, and then you can look it up using these. So these are kind of the open source databases for, you know, taking a look at, hey, what vulnerabilities may be out there. Um, there are also, you know, a bunch of other tools, if you're, you're more in this space, um, that have kind of, you know, scraped this and provided it uh, in, a, in a better world. Um, so things like Greenkeeper or Sneak uh, are great ways of just kind of, hey, I want to actually kind of make sense of this and even potentially check my dependencies locally. Uh, and then I think we'll have a demo later of doing this as well. Cool. So denials of service, another attack that I think a lot of people have heard of. So kind of a classic denial of service that everyone thinks about is, you know, you have some fixed number of resources, you have external traffic coming in, and now maybe you have malicious traffic. And so that traffic starts coming in and it overwhelms the resources and your machines start backing up and failing. So serverless actually introduces another several, like, relatively interesting denial of service attacks. You can have the traditional resource exhaustion where, you know, hey, your function or your app only has two gigs of RAM and you'll run out of RAM. Or, you know, you only have so much network throughput. Um, but, you know, because we're kind of focusing more on code, you can have some, some other really interesting ones of, you know, code errors that maybe it was a correct request, but due to, you know, some regular expression bug, now you end up with resource exhaustion. And then my personal favorite, which is very kind of new for serverless, um, right? Serverless infrastructure scales infinitely, right? Hopefully you saw that demo of, you know, zero to 10,000 instances. Um, I've profiled it and that's, you know, a million requests a second. Um, the thing that will run out first is your credit card, right? That, you're gonna, you're gonna hit that and you don't want a $10,000 bill or a $100,000 bill um, and things will start breaking, right? And so that's kind of this financial denial of service um, that serverless is, is so great. Um, it's so great on one side and results in this interesting problem on the other. Um, so, really common one here, again, with functions. We will start scaling up, um, and maybe there's this kind of impedance mismatch, right? So for those of you who have used, you know, SQL databases, uh, you can run out of file descriptors, right? You have so many machines on the front end trying to connect to this, and you'll exhaust your resources. So we provide a really nice tool uh, that allows you to max, set a maximum number of those functions that are running, right? So functions are single concurrency, they're handling one request. So you can actually say, I want four instances because I know that I have a backend resource that can only handle four concurrent connections or whatever the number is. And we can set that upper bound. And what'll happen now is we will start getting extra external traffic, we will start spinning up resources, and then above that, we'll start kind of load shedding that and applying back pressure. And so we'll start queuing up all those requests. We're not gonna drop them, but we will just start processing them so you only kind of get four at a time. So it's a nice way of, again, when you have this impedance mismatch of serverless can scale infinitely, but maybe the backend resources that you're using can't, you can use max instances to try and solve that. Um, it's worth noting that apps and containers running on Cloud Run are multi-concurrent by default. So I mentioned functions are single concurrency, so they're doing one request per instance. Apps will actually do multiple requests per instance. So if you're running App Engine or Cloud Run, we will actually start sending those requests back to your application. Uh, so for Cloud Run, for instance, we say you get a concurrency limit of 80 uh, by default. So you know, every instance, you know, assuming it doesn't run out of you know, memory or CPU, you know, it's, it's kind of bound to 80 concurrent requests. And obviously you can put that higher or lower depending on what you need. But just something to, to kind of, uh, you know, know if you really want, you could set, you know, your Cloud Run app to single concurrency and go back to that model, but we give you that flexibility. Okay, insecure credential storage, right? Don't store passwords in plain text. I feel like I don't need to say that, but it still happens, especially when people write, you know, really kind of small things. There are a lot of places where you're gonna encounter credentials and you may need to store them. So, storing database username and password, right? I see it all the time. Um, maybe you're doing OAuth credentials, so you're signing a user in and you're storing access tokens. Um, you're doing some kind of crypto. Maybe you have symmetric keys or you're storing asymmetric keys. Um, or similarly, maybe you have like publication credentials. Uh, so publishing your code to GitHub or deploying it. We'll talk about the most common one that I see. Um, so storing secrets in code, right? You end up with, we're connecting in our function to a MySQL database and you know, someone says, hey, here are the username and password. 
right? And your function code can leak. Maybe you accidentally make your GitHub repo public, and everything is bad, right? Someone can just connect to this database and take your data. So maybe you want to do something like storing secrets in environment variables. That kind of solves one of the problems of, hey, let's just set the database user to root and store it there, and your code looks a lot better, right? It just says, hey, you know, process n db user db password. Now if this gets public on the internet, it's fine, because you're binding those credentials in when you actually deploy in the environment variable. But there are actually a bunch of other potential issues in that world. Um, we'll actually, I think, see an attack on that at the end in a demo. Um, and so you may want to consider things like Cloud KMS. So Cloud KMS will let you do uh, encryption of, say, a file in GCS. And so you can store all of your secrets in that file and then pull them out. Uh, or similarly, if you want to use uh, a tool like HashiCorp Vault, maybe you're already running an instance of that uh, within your own company. Um, we also have a link there if you want to run Vault on GCP. Uh, and those are kind of you know, more secure ways of storing secrets. Um, there's a really great blog post by one of our developer advocates, Seth, um, on how to do those. So I think he writes a bunch of Go functions and a bunch of Python functions that show how to do a number of different uh, kind of secrets in serverless uh, type of scenarios. Cool. So those are all kind of, you know, some of them are, are unique to serverless, but most of them are kind of just general application security things. Execution flow manipulation, I think, is much more unique to serverless, and here's why. So we can imagine that I'm building you know, a, a simple function that deploys uh, or that writes some content to a Cloud SQL instance. Um, but the reality is, right, these are microservices. So I'm going to actually break them apart into the smallest unit of whatever they're doing you know, so that it's one line of code. So maybe I want to save some content. Maybe I have a markdown file, and I'm writing it to HTML, or I'm transforming it to HTML, and then saving the HTML into a database. So I'll have one function that's, hey, you know, I want to process some content, and that does markdown to HTML, and then one thing that actually saves the HTML. So you can imagine you know, the happy path here was just straight through. My one function calls my second function. My second function calls the database. But in this case, right, these functions are you know, public on the internet. People can just kind of call around them. And you may get a malicious call that's like, hey, I just want to save you know, some arbitrary data um, that's maybe not HTML or maybe not Markdown or anything. It kind of doesn't respect the flow of the application. That's a problem. So we've introduced, um, in actually in Cloud Run, you can already go and use it today. Uh, and in, in Cloud Functions, it's in alpha. We're still working on rolling that out. Uh, it's kind of hard to add to a, a generally available product. But what it does is it allows you to specify Cloud IAM policies on your functions and your services. And so that would allow you to authenticate developers or end users or you know, the other services, be they you know, Cloud Functions or Cloud Run services or you know, on-prem things that you're authenticating with a service account. And the other big change here is that services will become private by default. So in Cloud Run, when you deploy your Cloud Run instance, it's already private, and you have to make it public manually by adding you know, a policy down there. So that dash dash allow authenticated sets all users can invoke this, uh, this service, similarly with functions. So what does it look like? We can have our first function, that process content function, say, I want to allow anyone to invoke me. So we're going to say, all users get you know, the Cloud Functions invoker role. And on our second function, we're actually going to say, OK, you know, only this first function can invoke me. So that provides you know, a little bit of security where someone can't come around. Right? So we've now secured that channel between our two functions. So when someone tries to come in and save data directly, IAM is like, nope, we don't allow that. You can't do it. But for your developers, they can just say, hey, I want to curl this using an identity token that I'm pulling from gcloud or that I've generated via some other tool. And they can go and actually test that out if they want. And what about other cloud services, right? So uh, maybe it's not a human user that it's calling your uh, process content functions. Maybe you have a scheduled job, or you have task queues, or you have data coming from PubSub, right? So each of those products, so Cloud Scheduler, Tasks, and PubSub, can get a service account with a role. So uh, that could be you know, Cloud Function Invoker or similarly. And they can then make authenticated requests out to you know, GCF or Cloud Run or other services on the internet. And it's both you know, secured in transit via SSL, but then also it gives that identity token that can be validated by the IAM stuff that we just talked about. So it takes that token along, they validate it, Awesome. And as I mentioned, also available in PubSub. You can do authenticated push subscriptions out of PubSub. So it's really, really nice for kind of creating this very secure environment. 
Okay, and then I actually saw a question on the Dory, so hopefully whoever asked this is here. Um, there was a question about network restrictions. Um, so currently only App Engine of those three products offers uh, firewalls. So actually uh, Cloud Functions and Cloud Run don't yet offer them. They are not yet integrated with Cloud Armor, but that is something that we're looking into. Um, in at Google App Engine, you can say, hey, I do want to create a firewall, and that would be, you know, if you know that there is some known malicious actor, you can blacklist that IP. Or maybe you are operating within an environment where you need to whitelist certain ones. Otherwise, strongly recommend identity-based security. Um, a lot of large companies that I've talked to do kind of this strong outer wall and then no security inside. And that's obviously not good, because if someone does penetrate that, that outer wall, they can do whatever they want. And identity-based security, kind of going back to, to those granularity, uh, to, to a granularity thing, sort of, you know, it, it makes the barrier feel a little more permeable, but generally every service has their own little wall around it, uh, which kind of makes that more secure. It's all trade-offs in engineering. Um, okay, so continuing on the, uh, you know, ways of authenticating your application, um, we see a lot of times that people end up with overprivileged identities in those functions. So by default, Every function shares the same identity, and that identity has the editor role. So it can actually go and spin up VMs and do a bunch of things. Uh, that's basically because we said, hey, we know that people want to you know, build functions to demo things really quickly. Um, they should be able to do that without having to learn all the complexities of IAM. Um, but we then said, OK, well, obviously, if you're deploying these things in production, you need this concept of least privilege, where your function can only access the one thing that it needs. And so that is where this concept of per function identity comes in. And it says, okay, we know that this function needs exactly this role. We don't want it shared with anyone. Um, and that's how we actually talked a little bit earlier about how you know, our save or our process content function can talk to our save data function and only those. Uh, so we can walk through an example of that. Um, I can create a service account called process content. And I can say, okay, on cloud functions, I'm going to grant uh, on that save data function, I'm going to say, okay, service account, process content, at whatever, gets the cloud functions invoker role. And then I can deploy my function using that service account. And so what I've done is I've said, okay, on function A, you know, you get this specific role. I'm going to deploy you with that. And on function B, that function can invoke it. And then we can do the same thing, actually, for our second function. So our second function is talking to a Cloud SQL instance. So we can say, okay, we'll give you the save data function, uh, or we'll, we'll give you a, a service account called save data, and we'll do the same thing, right? We'll say, hey, um, on the project, give you the Cloud SQL client role, so you can actually create a connection to Cloud SQL. And then we will deploy our function using that. So now with per function identity, function A can talk to function B, and function B can talk to our database. And really, the important thing here is function B can't go and talk to any other thing, right? It can't go out and talk to GCS or any of the other you know, cloud services because it doesn't have that access. And what about things within network restrictions, right? So maybe you're not running uh, you know, a Cloud SQL instance. Maybe you're running uh, you know, some other database that doesn't you know, integrate well with cloud IAM, but it's within a VPC. So you're running that on cloud, and we obviously you know, can't just make an HTTP request to your VPC. You can use a VPC connector. So these are now in beta. And they allow you to talk to instances, obviously, within a VPC. So GCE or GKE, um, things like Cloud Memory Store that are also running uh, you know, within a VPC. And then even on-prem, you can go through compute running in that VPC onto on-prem. So again, you configure a deploy time. You say gcloud functions deploy with a VPC connector. And that will let you kind of go through that connector to that compute. OK, I'll let photos, photos continue. And then can we switch over to the demo machine, please? OK, it wants me to relaunch Chrome. Yes. Um, so what we're looking at is kind of the, uh, well, you're looking at all of my functions. I have a lot of them. Um, and we have a really, really uh, you know, simple view of the app that we just created. So we have function A and function B. And what function A does is function A literally just uh, proxies to function B. We can actually look at the source over here. And we can say, hey, um, it's going to fetch a token and then call uh, our other function with that token. And then function B literally just returns 200 OK. There's, it's not even worth looking at. It's a really, really small function. Um, but as, as you just saw, 
currently anyone on the internet can talk to either of those functions, right? But we really want it such that function A or function B can only be accessed by function A. So over in the service accounts page, I created function A and a, a thing called no role, where I just say, hey, you know, this is a service account that I want to give no permissions to. Um, and what we can do to secure our app is we can edit function A. So currently, it has the default compute service account. So we could say, hey, we want to give you function A service account. We will redeploy you. And then we can, on function B, open up that permissions tab. And you'll notice, so the invoker permission, which allows anyone to, to access it, it has all users currently. It's a public function. So we'll delete that. And just to prove to you, that's deleted. So come on. Takes a second to propagate. Oh, should be, would that be? Yeah. Live demos are always fun. We'll just create a new one. Function B, OK. Um, I think I have given it one second. Do, do, do. Function B. We will add to function B oh, the service account from function A. And then I will debug it a little more. So we can just paste that in and say, yep, the function A service account. We will give you the cloud functions invoker role and save that. And as you can see, there are a lot of who else has. Oh, there are probably, I'm, I'm assuming that that role has been given uh, another, or that that user has been given another role. But let's just quickly try it again. Okay. Oh, I think I, well, I, I must have flipped something. Uh, let's take a look over here again. So over here, I have given function A all users. But, and then function B, I will just actually redeploy it with its no role service account instead of the app engine default one and see what it does. We'll just give that a second. Doo -doo -doo. But the end result should be not this, where we should get OK through there, and we should there. So this is, it's been redeployed, and that is not public on the internet. And then this one, that is OK. So there we go. <laughs> Took a little while, but we're there. Um, and so what we've done, again, uh, function A is running with its particular service account. We can go and check that out. So it even says, hey, it's running under the function A service account. Function B will be running under that no role service account. And I'll just pull them out, and we'll refresh them manually to prove. There we go. OK, back to the slides, please. OK, so there are a couple of other issues that we may face along the way. So we talked about this concept of least privilege within GCP, of your function only being able to talk to you know, a Cloud SQL instance and not a GCS instance, for instance. Um, so there are a couple of other ways that data may be exfiltrated from your app. Uh, for instance, you know, that process content function, instead of sending, you know, making that HTTP request to save data, maybe it's going to say, oh, you know, send it to evil.com and steal all of that data. Right? And that could be caused by you know, something like a remote code execution, or maybe you have you know, that, the name of that URL is in a variable, and someone you know, somehow got in there and changed it. And another similar one is right, maybe the path is the same where you know, you're still storing data correctly, but now someone has you know, dumped your environment and is saving that to the database. And now your data is stored somewhere where it shouldn't, and maybe you, know, you have another thing that says, you, know, you have another function that's read content, and now they can read the content of your database username and password. Right? There are a number of, of very interesting threats along that model. And a similar one uh, that actually could cause those is things like query injection. Right? So hopefully everyone has heard of uh, you know, SQL injection attacks, another XKC comic about little Bobby tables, right? Don't name your kid a SQL, uh, a valid SQL statement, because things will not end well. Um, highly recommend just reading all of XKCD, by the way. It's great, great stuff. Um, and so, right, you know, maybe we have our, our save data function, and it does something like this, right? It's like, hey, you know, I'm going to create this query string and just save my data directly into the database and, and pull it in, you know, directly from the body. 
Uh, well, that's great until you know you name the user Mike drop tables posts, um, right? And then we're inserting that directly into our database, right? Wouldn't it be great if uh, you know, a we could write a bunch of code to manually escape that. Um, you know, we could even do the like Galaxy Brain thing of a lot of uh, a lot of SQL um, libraries will actually provide uh, a really nice way of of doing those queries for you that automatically escape them. Um, but there are actually a number of third-party providers, some of whom we have here in the room today, um, who can make this a little easier, right? So um, folks like Intrinsic, Protego, and PureSec offer a number of categories of defenses for your serverless applications. Um, so some of them occur at build time. Uh, so preventing, uh, you know, the, the shipping your functions with editor role because they can say, hey, based on data we've seen, you know, you should only need these, uh, you know, these three privileges. And then they can also do things like, you know, check all of those CVE databases to make sure that your dependencies aren't vulnerable. And then they also provide a category of runtime defenses, right? So, uh, you know, doing the kind of web application firewall type things to prevent SQL injection, um, or restricting read from the file system so someone can't just dump your entire process or read all of the local files, um, or doing things like controlling outbound networking, right? So don't send data to evil.com. So I'll highlight one of the tools, and then uh, we can have uh, Protego come up on stage and demonstrate theirs. Um, so one of them is called Function Shield, uh, so by PureSec, and it does uh, a couple of things. So you can just say disable outbound networking or disable read and write from slash temp, uh, and you can do a couple of things. You can say, hey, I want to actively block all of these, um, or you can say, like, hey, I only want to alert on them. So, you know, it shows up in stack driver logging. It says, hey, it looks like this request was attempted. You know, we would have failed that if you were kind of in strict mode. Otherwise, you know, we're just letting you know. So this is kind of more about the um, letting you know and then potentially locking things down. So, for instance, I run my functions. Most of them don't need to create child processes. Um, and so I say, yep, you know, alert me on outbound HTTP, but disallow read and write from temp, disallow, you know, uh, child processes, don't allow anyone to read the source code, that kind of thing. And then Hilal, do you want to come up? Um, he can give a demo on Protego and what kind of they provide in this space. So I'll hand you that, though I don't know if you need it. If I need it. I was sure I'd fall on the steps. That was my big vision. Cool. Thanks. So thanks, Mike. Um, so before I hit play, right, I'll figure that out. Uh, before I hit play, just a, a quick word about what we do. So I, I think uh, Mike set it up in terms of what uh, we look at in terms of security, both at build time and at runtime. Uh, for security, our, one of our particular focuses is on using automated tools to understand what the code does in order to automate all the configuration of the things that Mike just talked about. So try to make it so that you don't have to sit there and configure what you think your function should do or shouldn't do, but rather developers write code and security people can be you know, assured that the code can do the things it can do, and then the security policy is going to prevent the things that it can't do. That's a big focus for us. So whether it's IAM roles, runtime policy, permissions, uh, you know, defense, et cetera, all that is, is automated in a way that's driven by code. So let's see a quick demo. So um, this is, well, you know, we, we announced uh, availability of our product for AWS, those guys, uh, back in September. We've been hardworking at getting the things that we do to do work well on GCP and take advantage of some of the cool things that are in this pl platform. Um, and I think we expect, don't, don't, don't record me, but by the end of the quarter, it's about two months to be able uh, to be, let's, let's say public beta, if not uh, uh, availability. Uh, but I wanted to give you a quick, quick glimpse of what the product does and how it works. So I'm gonna hit play. I may hit pause a little bit, just if I see it's running too fast. I did two things. Okay, first of all, I was gonna apologize for recording my demo, but now I feel better, because live demos are always yeah, bad. Live and, demos are hard. And I, I, I feel like you, how do I, what am I doing here? Will that play? Okay, so here's the, here's the quick setup. Wait, if I hit space, will it pause? Yes. Yeah, well, cool. Here's the quick setup. We've got a single function app running uh, in Google Cloud. It is a Slack chatbot. So we're going to interact with it through Slack. We're going to send message, messages to it through Slack. We're going to get you know, messages back. Um, we'll do a, just a quick tour of what's in the app and what's there and what we're doing, and then we'll just show you how the app works, and then we'll start attacking it with different attacks and kind of see how the platform uh, reacts to it. So you can see uh, we've got a, a function. Uh, you can see all the runtime information, et cetera. You can see we've got a bucket, right? Can I can't even see what's going on here. It's yeah, cloud there's, there's a bucket there. Cloud SQL instance in a bucket. It's good that you can see. Uh, okay, now you can see our platform and what we see. 
Uh, so this is the Protego dashboard. You can see kind of the view of the application, uh, you know, what resource type triggers, what we know about it. Uh, we'll dig into you know, this particular function. You can see there are two functions. We're going to go into one of them and show you kind of the, the posture of that function. So what, what is everything that we know about the function? How is it triggered? What can it do? What's its runtime? All that information. And particularly, we're going to focus on what are, what's, it, what's it allowed to do versus what we think it's supposed to be allowed to do because we've analyzed and understood the code and so we know which permissions it needs and which it doesn't need. We also know what things it needs to be able to do at runtime, like what processes it needs to be able to launch. We know what network connections it needs to make. And so those things have been whitelisted. Anything else we can, that we can then block, and we'll see that in a second. If we take a look at the task view here, this is our, the part of our product which is kind of more the, the, run, the build time tool, but you can see it here in the product. It's telling us, hey, we've got a permissive role. Look at all these permissions that came by choosing a you know, managed role. And actually, these are the only permissions this function needs to run. And if you want to aim for least privileges, an automated path where you can build service accounts for each function that have just the permissions that they need rather than all the permissions that come with wildcarding or choosing sort of unman you know, managed roles, et cetera. We also see a vulnerable dependency. So you know, Mike talked about that earlier. We're, de we're detecting the CVE uh, for that dependency and giving you information about it. So let's interact a little bit with this chatbot. We're going to just send some messages to it and see how it reacts. So you can see that when we write, this is about as sophisticated as it is. We, we type a message, and it types something random and hopefully sometimes funny back. Uh, it also stores a history of our messages. We can upload files to it. So we just wanted to make sure we had a setup that we can do all these different uh, injection attacks on it. All right, so here we'll upload a file, and it'll store it, et cetera. And you can see that we put the file in there. We'll pop over to the storage bucket and see that that file got uploaded to that storage bucket. All right? Let's take a look. There we go. So there's our file we just uploaded. So now if we go back and we start seeing, well, what, what, what malicious things that we can, can we do? Let's try doing a little bit of uh, SQL injection on this, right? So we're seeing that when we ask for latest messages, we're getting back a list of latest messages from the database. That makes us think there's some SQL inside the database. We're going to send a message which has got some SQL injection in it. So remember, the function is going to take these messages and insert them into the database using an insert query. But now that we shoved in a little uh, select text there as well, we're going to magically get some data stuff, stuffed into the database that we, we, we shouldn't have been there, and now we can pull it back out. So that was kind of what Mike described before, where we leveraged the ability to do some injection to put something into a database that shouldn't have been there, and then we pulled it out. Now we'll do another injection attack. We'll do some code injection here. This code injection is going to essentially just do curl inside the function. So we're taking advantage of that node serialized bug that you saw earlier in the posture view where you saw we're using a vulnerable library. Let's take advantage of that. And you can see how when we execute that, send that message to the Slack chatbot, it's generating a curl request back to our server. So we now know, hey, this thing's vulnerable to code injection. Cool. Let's see what other data we can extract out of it. Or let's see what we can do. In this case, let's delete the uh, file that we created earlier, which is something we shouldn't be able to do. And what I want to point out about that is, if you saw earlier, this function shouldn't be able to delete things. It doesn't need that permission, but we gave it that permission, and now the attacker can exploit that permission to take advantage of that and delete a file that he shouldn't be able to delete. So had we configured the IAM permissions correctly for that function, we wouldn't have been able to do that. Now here you can see what Protego sees when these things happen. So in line, this stuff is being, in, in this case, we're in alert mode. I didn't mention that. We're in alert mode, so we're not blocking anything yet. But you can see all the types of uh, events that Protego is picking up. I see command injection patterns. I see behaviors I didn't expect. All these things are being detected and could be blocked, and you can get all that information. And then we can go and switch that into block mode. So we switch our defense mode into block mode. We can then try the same attack again, and what we'd see is that attack wouldn't happen at all. So let's go back to Slack, and we'll just try that same injection attack again, and hopefully nothing will happen on the bottom. I say hopefully. It's a video, right? You guys know how it ends. Um, there you go. So nothing happens on the bottom. So we try that same injection attack. Same mechanism that, we we, that I showed you before detected it, but now we're blocking it in line. And just to, to give a little illustration of that, we can pop into the logs for that function, and we can see what Protego is logging into the logs of that function in, in real time as it happens. And here you can see, uh, if you look really carefully, what the event was, what the, you know, what the pattern was or, or event was that we were blocking. And in this case, you can see the type of reaction was block as opposed to what would have been there before, which is alert. So we're actually detecting and blocking in real time as well as reporting it. So that's us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, so the last thing that I want to talk about 
was a poor developer experience, right? So one of the goals of serverless is to kind of abstract away a lot of the toil and give developers a really, really fast way of developing. But there are still kind of developer experience speed blocks or, or roadblocks uh, along the way. So a number of issues that we see, uh, particularly people using shared environments, right? That's a really common way to pollute your database or leak credentials or similar things because you're sharing that information that really shouldn't be shared across environments. Um, so using project boundaries to enforce those, uh, that, that isolation is kind of a good developer experience practice. Um, and using tools like Deployment Manager or Terraform to then deploy your functions, right? It's really easy to just do G Cloud uh, functions deploy, but especially for you know, your production and, and similar environments, you want to actually have a bunch of that automated. Which is going over to our second side of, right, if you have you know, a slow tool chain or you're manually SCPing files from one place to another, you're going to end up with security issues just because people make mistakes, right? So setting up CI CD tools, so Spinnaker or Cloud Build, to, you know, hey, I actually have a couple apps that are running uh, in, you know, in, in uh, the cloud source editor, so I edit all of my code there. I then commit it to a Git repo. It's picked up automatically by cloud build, built entirely, deployed the containers, does a traffic split, and everything is kind of safe, and I don't have to worry about it, right? So I'm not manually doing those things, and I'm not going to screw it up because I did it once and I tested it. So um, we actually already demoed, so I'm going to just uh, leave that slide there. But we have a couple minutes left. If folks have questions, please walk up to a microphone. I don't think we can deliver them, unfortunately. Uh, but I'm happy to answer questions. Otherwise, thank you all very much for coming. I really enjoyed it. Hopefully you learned a lot.